So thank you so much for joining us today. Your work in AI covers so many important areas, including oncology, which you started working on after your breast cancer diagnosis in 2014. Uh, you also have a new paper out that uses deep learning to predict the breast cancer risk based on mammograms. So could you talk a little bit about that work? Yeah, so um, the uh, kind of my first foray out of my core area, which was digital language processing until 2014, uh, was to try to kind of solve the problem, which seems to me like obvious that we have technology to do that, but for some reason it's not done, is to predict the risk of uh, you know, future occurrences of cancer. And the idea itself is very old, actually. Uh, you know, doctors even in the 60s realized that if you look at the mammograms, which were obviously way less precise than today, uh, of women who were later diagnosed, you can see certain patterns because, you know, as we all know, cancer doesn't develop from today to tomorrow. So it's a long process. And there are some signatures in the tissues that is more likely to be affected by cancer. So in traditional kind of medicine, the way these uh, biomarkers were done was using something called density. And actually, you know, every woman who does mammogram uh, gets this readout that pretty much tells how wide is an image. Uh, it captures the kind of ratio of fibrous tissue versus fat in the breast. And, um, and there is some correlation between, uh, you know, how dense is your tissue with uh, the likelihood of getting breast cancer. Now, of course, uh, these kind of measurements of how white something is, is extremely imprecise. There were a lot of studies that demonstrate that it's very subjective reading. And also, you know, there are different types of white. So for a human eye, it's really hard to identify these subtle uh, patterns. So the idea that we have is instead of kind of trying to um, learn, you know, this very imprecise biomarker identified by human eye, we would just give to the machine the images and the outcomes of the same patient was within up to five years after this image. Because we know that, I mean, if now we go to 2016, we would have the outcomes for women, you know, within one, two, up to five years. And if the hypothesis was correct, the assumption is that given sufficient amount of training data, and you know, a good learning model, you would be able to identify the patterns. And indeed we did. And currently these models do you know, orders of magnitude better you know, than everything else that was used to predict cancer. And now we, uh, we started by implementing it on the data at Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, now we tested in multiple other institutions with different populations like in uh, Taiwan or in Sweden, and also these models move to clinical implementation. So when the patients now go to MGH, the machine runs and provides their risk profile. That's awesome. That's so cool that the deep learning models are deployed and, and working on patients. Uh, what do you think are some of the biggest outstanding challenges that you face in applying deep learning to oncology? So I think there are challenges both in terms of questions that we are asking and what we are doing with the technologies that we are developing. Let me actually start with the second one. Um, medicine is very kind of slow changing area. And the reason it's so slow changes is because it's clearly very heavy regulated and you want to make sure that when you are bringing a new technology, you know, the physician understands it, you know, the patient to the extent possible understands it and that the harms are minimized. And as a result of this challenge and the fact that, you know, majority of the physicians that today are practicing didn't really study AI in medical school, some of the technologies that have been developed uh, that are ready to be deployed are still not deployed. Or even if they are deployed, uh, they may not be utilized to the best uh, utilization uh, to help patients. Um, and um, I think there is uh, already for many, many technologies, imaging technologies that have been developed, what I hope we will see in the next few years is really clinical trials that tell us, um, you know, how to utilize this prediction in the best possible way. And for instance, what I would envision that if we, a patient went uh, and like did, for instance, mammogram, and um, she has very, very low risk of cancer, 
maybe instead of screening for every year, which is a current recommendation after certain age, you're going to screen for every three years. It's not only decreasing cost, but it also, you know, all the harms associated with screening uh, and, you know, the anxiety. Um, on the other hand, the patients that are seems to be high risk, you can dedicate all the resources to better screening with MRI, maybe do, you know, different chemopreventative measures to decrease their chance to develop cancer. So this is not an AI question, it's a clinical question. What do you do? You have technology, it's not perfect, but it does good things. So this, I think, is a big question, like, which is like in the border of medicine and AI, how do you implement it in the best possible way? And um, the interesting part about these technologies is that in some cases, human can validate it. So if you're using this technology to identify fracture or cancer, you know, radiologists can look at it and say, yeah, the machine identified this spot, which means um, the patient, you know, has it. But when we're talking about stuff like risk, in this case, we actually human eye cannot really detect it. That's why radiologists are not even trying. Uh, so even if machine gives some heat map and say, I'm looking at this part of the image, uh, human cannot really validate it because pattern is too complex. And I think as machine learning becomes more and more elaborate and more data sources are used, it may be impossible to take this very complex, you know, distributional signature and translate it in a way that physician can validate it. And that's why we need to, to be, you know, thinking, how do we know that the models are actually doing right things if human physicians cannot validate them? So all these questions, which have some AI component, but also a lot of clinical component, are really, I think, a main a roadblock for the implementation. Now, in terms of what I see the most interesting part in the oncology actually relates to drug design. I think there is a lot of things that we can do with imaging and we can add sequencing and we can add other biomarkers. You know, there is obviously a place to improve these models, to make them better, but there are some areas of oncology which are really unaddressed today um, by AI, like, um, you know, predicting, uh, you know, individualized, for instance, drug uh, combinations for patients. Uh, and in this case, it's a question of biology and AI. What kind of, you know, information do you collect about the patients, the tumor and everything else, how you can match, even if we're not talking about like individualized in terms of create a molecule, which works for everybody, this would be much harder, but even select the best existing therapy or combination therapy. This is a huge place um, for where AI can make a difference. And I don't think we are entering this domain so far. But, but, but I believe as you know, more and more resources uh, like CancerMap and others become available, um, there will be a place uh, to make a contribution. Yeah, it's so interesting. I personally am looking forward to a future with more personalized medicine, and I'm excited to see if deep learning can help make that a reality. Um, shifting gears a little bit, I am a tad biased here because I work on machine learning for drug discovery, but I think your work um, making models that both predict chemical properties of molecules as well as generate new molecules is so exciting. Um, so in your opinion, what do you think are the main advantages and limitations of machine learning when applied to drug discovery? Uh, so first, great to hear that you're working in this field. I personally think it's like a field where a lot of exciting things are gonna be happening you know, in the near future. Uh, and there is really a place to redo the discovery process, which is currently based so much on the experimentation, which is prohibitively slow because of it. And, you know, we cannot experimentally go and investigate, you know, 10 in the 60s possible drug-like molecules, even if we're talking about small molecules. Um, so the uh, hope here is that by having predictive models, you can sufficiently limit the space of candidates, which you can then in detail go and validate in the lab. And again, another hope is that if you are really can understand the profile of the uh, molecule and you can um, 
maybe even see how it will work with different biologists of different patients, you can predict the side effects and other things, which today we may discover experimentally after drug is already you know, in, uh, in patients. So there are a lot of places to do this predictive modeling. Now, the, there are challenges which are like practical challenges and algorithmic challenges. Practical challenges is that for some diseases, we have high throughput screening data. For other diseases, we still don't have this molecular data. For instance, for biologics, there is almost no available data in the public domain, which of course limits what uh, you can do. Um, but, um, you know, but it slowly changes. And the beauty of the uh, AI methods here, that, you know, when you develop a technique for like virtual screening, it actually, the same method can be trained to predict antibacterial property. It can be predict, you know, uh, tumor inhibitory properties and many other things. So as far as you develop the model and it works, uh, somebody who does have the data can take it into their pharmaceutical company and apply it. So, so even in the current, world where you know we, we we don't didn't apply to all possible therapeutic areas there is already a place um, where these models make a difference now in terms of the interesting question algorithmic question moving forward one of the big questions here is that you know machine learning models work well when of course you have enough training data and your training data is matching well your test data that they come from similar distribution now, it, what you want to do in discovery, you may have, you know, screening for one therapeutic problem and you want to uh, extrapolate to other parts of chemical space. Even if you have enough of the screen molecules, um, how can you know what's going on in other parts of, of the space? And of course you can apply this model, but it's accuracy for many of today's model would be very much affected by this distributional shift. So there is a big question, how can we improve generalizability or generalizability of this model so they can operate in other parts of the space? And I think here, the most exciting direction is actually to bring biology. When we started working in this area like five years ago, we, we really saw, and this is kind of a standard in the field today, you know, you have a 2D graph of the molecule and then you try to put your property or try to design it, but you don't really understand what's going on. You don't even do it in this, you don't even model 3D structures, the conformers. You don't know how, you know, which targets it operates. You can just predict it has antibacterial property, but you don't really know why this property arises. And if you have a lot of screening data, then you can learn it many times that what we've seen. But if your data is very limited or you really want to extrapolate, we strongly believe that by incorporating biological information, the mechanism and other knowledge and understanding exactly which part of molecule is doing what to the effect of the therapeutic in general, this is a direction to move forward and um, kind of this biochemical view it's really emerging area like it's very very new but I think we will see more and more kind of not biologically naive models that we use until now. Yeah for sure I, I know you touched on this a little bit but where do you see the future of the field of ML applied to drug discovery like where is it going in five years ten years so I think that right now what we see is that a lot of these tools, like for instance, virtual screening tools, they are used even MIT tools through the uh, consortium that we build at MIT. They are already deployed in many pharmaceutical companies. So I think what we will see is that the accuracy of this tool will continue to increase and their penetration in the industry uh, will be uh, higher. But where I see we are moving in five or 10 years, that this tool would be really a very standard part of any you know, drug development pipeline taking bigger and bigger portion of kind of design. Um, like, uh, let me give you one example that we are currently not doing, but clearly a place to, to do more of it or to, to, to improve is one of the things that we know that the drugs fail, you know, you can easily through high throughput screening identify molecules, uh, you know, that work uh, on cells in the lab, but 
uh, when you are trying to put them in the animal, there is no guarantee that they will work. And when it moves even to human, there is still another, you know, leap of faith, is it going to work or not? So one question is how you can collect the data that uh, enables you actually to predict what's going to happen <laughs> uh, along the pipeline. And also, uh, again, really much, to, we collect so much information about you know, tumors, about other things. How can we really correlate the drug, the molecule to a particular, um, you know, to a particular kind of biological context? And you know, the way I want to think about it, the 10 years from now, if we really can perfect it, and these techniques are really highly predictive, I hope we can you know, get closer to the idea that your drugs are truly personalized for you with your unique biology rather than having, you know, like um, one size fits all that we have today. And another important thing is really decreasing the side effects uh, and um, decreasing the time and the cost, uh, which today is like several billion dollars per, um, you know, Per molecule, which is, I mean, not the discovery itself, but the whole pipeline is so expensive. So my hope is that introducing all these techniques, making them much stronger than what they are today would enable us to get there. Absolutely. I, I also am hoping for that future. Now it wouldn't be a, a pandemic era Zoom call if we didn't talk about the pandemic. So <laughs> you've recently pivoted some of these drug discovery efforts to COVID-19, including predicting drug combinations. So what do you see as the role for machine learning in combating both COVID as well as future, hopefully not, but possibly future pandemics? So uh, we did do a uh, recent work and that's where we actually brought biological context. We didn't have any choice because the number of screen combination was just 300. You cannot run a deep learning model on 300 combinations. Um, we demonstrated that you can find synergetic combination with machine learning instead of just, you know, kind of combinatorially trying all different um, uh, groupings. But the way I want to think us moving forward is really to decrease the time, be it an individual therapeutic or be it a combination, to make it as a function conditioning on the particular pathogen. So uh, now we need to get this pathogen, we need to get an assay, we need to screen it, then we can apply machine learning. So the question is, can you, when you collect the data and you identify the pathogen itself, be it virus, be it something else, how can we uh, immediately, just based on its features, predict what kind of, um, uh, you know, by what kind of molecules will work on it. Um, and uh, the similar question also, you know, arises in terms of antibiotics. Um, if you now have a drug, there are many possible mutations. Can you predict which one, create a molecule which will work on this mutation? Or alternatively, if you can model the distribution of mutation, you can say that's what we expect to happen as resistant grows. Uh, can we create a molecule that is likely to be effective against all these uh, possible mutations? So, that's where I hope that the time, the lead time would really dramatically decrease. Yeah, awesome. Well, it's been great hearing about your work, but I'd love to zoom out a little bit and talk about you. So could you tell us about your trajectory and how you got into machine learning? You know, it, it, it was actually totally random. So when I was um, doing my um, studies in Israel, my master's in Israel, I needed to select a master's thesis. And <laughs> there were very few people who, with whom I could do master's thesis, was, you know. So uh, I really liked my professor and um, I asked him, what is your area of expertise? He told me natural language processing. He said, okay, can I do the thesis? And that's how I, I started. And, um, the interesting part was that this time was really a kind of when the revolution in natural language processing was happening. Like just a few years before the early 90s, people were still doing natural language processing, you know, with writing grammars and writing rules and all deterministic. And when I started, you know, not because of me, obviously, because of the field, um, people start seeing that the models which are trained on the data can deliver you some answer. And of course, you know, the 
question that were asked were like very small questions by today's standards, but it was really a paradigm shift uh, when the things move from very kind of linguistic rule-based things towards what we call today machine learning at the time they were called statistical methods. And I remember I went to my first conference still as a master's student in Madrid in ACL. And it was really interesting because you can really see like the, maybe 60 or 70% of the papers were still old time kind of papers. And then other papers with really new approaches. And, um, and that's how I started with my master's thesis. Uh, and I was really excited because you could kind of go into a new area and be the first one to solve some problem. So that's how I got into it. And I was, um, I did my PhD at Columbia. And again, the field was changing very rapidly. A lot of uh, kind of new problems, developments. And I continued doing NLP. And what I'm thinking, which was really fascinating, when I started doing natural language processing, when people were talking about machine translation, you know, either you can translate a sentence of seven words at a time from English to French, which are very easy by today's standards. This was like a major discovery. Like nobody believed, people were trying to learn, you know, correspondences between words. Nobody believed that it is possible to create a model which will be used by humans, like by any kind of lay audience. It was just like going to the moon and building a house and a swimming pool. Like there was no way. And then within like 10 years, the situation totally changed. You know, Google Translate become part uh, of, uh, you know, an everyday life. Like nobody even surprised when they're using it. But this cup was really, really humongous. And that's why I'm so interested in the drug discovery field. Because I think we are in drug discovery today a bit like what we were in natural language processing like in mid nineties, when there are so many new opportunities. And obviously, you know, it's much harder to do drug discovery because it involves experimentation and regulatory issues and other things, but it is really a huge space. And today, nobody even thinks about natural language processing without these neural models and every day they become better and better. Uh, and, and we use so many of these products in our daily life. So that's what um, excites me about um, drug discovery. And I should tell you that until like 2014, I was very happy doing natural language processing. I'm still doing natural language processing, but I didn't kind of, I didn't have much interest in other areas because, you know, sometimes we kind of say, this is my past and I'm doing that. And, you know, I know what I'm doing. And then, uh, you know, when I was sick, I really, it was like an eye opening moment to me because I saw that, you know, the technologies that we are using in NLP not even solve machine processing, but solve like variety of tasks. Like I walk on, I still walk on ancient language decipherment, which is kind of really esoteric task. It's not like somebody is going to be happy because you decipher the ancient language. I saw, wow, there is so much technology and so much advancement in this front. On the other hand, when you go to MGH, which is a top hospital in the country, in terms of you know, AI and information technology, we're still in the stone age. And you see a lot of human suffering. You see a lot of uncertainty and people are asking questions where you know the answers are in the data, but it's just not done. And, um, you know, like um, after serious illnesses, you know, I've seen myself and other people, you know, kind of start asking your questions, you know, why I am here and what do I want to achieve with my own life? And I kind of felt I really cannot go back to NLP the way I was doing it before and say, you know, it's fine, I'm done, I'm back to my MIT office. I really felt I have to do something. And that's how I got into um, you know trying to do predictions uh, based on the images because you know my own cancer was diagnosis was delayed by at least two years uh, looking at the images back and and other problems that I started working on and sometimes things just happen again in a random way uh, like you can ask how did they go to drug discovery Klaus Anson which is a professor at MIT um, wants to submit a grant for DARPA for doing retrosynthesis for molecules. And somebody just introduced us because he was looking for, for 
you know, a person who can help. And because I was back and I was kind of searching myself, I said, okay, fine. I didn't even realize it because any connection, you know, to therapeutics or anything, I just decided, okay, let me see what I can do here. And slowly we, we started developing, we saw it was really a new field. We started building up at MIT in this area. And then, you know, my office looks into Navartis building. And, uh, and then we realized, wow, there is really a lot of opportunities to bring this technology to pharmaceutical industry. And that's how I <laughs> migrated into that field. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your trajectory. It really resonates with me. I, um, I have a chronic illness and I was treated with IV antibiotics for like years in college. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in antibiotics drug discovery right now. It's because I saw how bad it was and I was inspired to hopefully be able to change it um, with some newer approaches. All right, I have one more question just to wrap it up. Um, do you have any advice for younger students that are interested in the field of machine learning? So, um, first of all, I think that today machine learning arrived to the point that the field is matured enough. So there, there are two types of machine learning you can do. There are people who go and study computer science and who really develop new algorithms which are faster, which have better generalization guarantees and so on. For that, you need to go study computer science and be major in this area. Now, there is another area when you are not a computer scientist, but you really want to apply it for drug discovery or for climate change or for whatever else you are interested in. And the good news is that today there are classes, like we're teaching a new class modeling with machine uh, learning uh, at MIT, which are designed for non-majors, which are designed for people who are not, you know, computer scientists per se, but they want in an way apply this technology and adapt it to their problems of interest and uh, this class really designed like couples so you have me and professor tomiyako teaching common grounds and then there are for instance another molecular side which has students from biological engineering and chemical engineering which have a class which shows how it can be applied for modeling problems in this area. So the whole piece that, you know, the new generation that comes out of MIT would have these tools and they will be able to use them the same way as everybody use computers, even you don't have to be a computer scientist for that. So machine learning tools came to the point of maturity that at least for some problems, you can, if you have, you know, basic education, apply it to your problems of interest. And I'm sure there are other classes which can provide you with this opportunity. So again, I would say the most important thing is just don't be afraid because when you're entering, it seems that there is something really huge that needs to be done. But if you take even the simplest of the classes and you can already start moving and then you can realize which parts of machine learning are more relevant to what you are trying to do. But um, I would say not to be afraid and just try. I think that's great advice. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been really awesome. And yeah, I just really appreciate getting the chance to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.